Hi everybody. So we are going to get started today with our fundamentals of the nervous system. So to start with, uh, we want to understand that there are three main overlapping functions of the nervous system, which are identified as sensory input, integration, and motor output. So let's go ahead and take a look at this picture to start with, and then we'll go from there. So if you look at the nervous system, you can see clearly there's the three branches of this. The first part, as you can see on the red, uh, sorry, on the blue section is identified as sensory input. The word sensory input, if you guys use uh, just logic, uh, sensory nervous system would be, oh, sorry guys, uh, would basically be uh, collecting data from your typical senses, which are your sense of vision, hearing, taste, smell, and sense of touch. Now, we will be using the proper vocabulary for these later on, uh, but for now, basically your common senses that they collect data from your external environment. Please do note that you also collect data from your internal environment, which creates senses like your vestibular sense, your sense of balance, or visceral sense, which are senses that measure things or changes internally, like when your bladder is full, when you have a stomach ache, etc. The second part of the nervous system is what you see as depicted as your brain and your spinal cord. This is identified as your integration center. Because the job of this part, which is basically also identified as your central nervous system, is to first uh, receive the data and then make sense of that data. As soon as the data has been cleared in terms of what that data means, your brain will make a decision and based on that decision, it sends a message out, which we can see at the third branch called motor output. Again, data will be going out from your brain to different parts of your body including your muscles, uh, including your glands, and allow them to do what they need to do to allow the body to continue surviving. So in this picture, your sensory input that you see in blue is your vision, brain receiving the message and in integrating that signal, and your motor output is your skeletal muscle flexing, causing you to uh, lift up the glass for the purpose of drinking. Now, one quick note, and I'll expand on that later on. Uh, when you think about motor output, uh, motor output includes the effects on all of your glands, uh, as well as the three type of muscles that we have. Now, we already learned that the three type of muscles can be identified as voluntary, as in movements are under my control, associated with a skeletal muscle, and you also have involuntary muscle movement, which are identified with your smooth muscle and your cardiac muscle. Think about this logically, guys. You cannot move your heart. You cannot cause your heart to beat faster or slower. You cannot change the size of your iris, which is made up of a smooth muscle. And you cannot move your stomach muscles or your intestinal muscles to slow down or speed up the fact that you're digesting food. Now, moving on, you can see this branching that we discussed right here. Again, sensory input, millions of sensory receptors collecting data from inside and outside. Integration, which is your brain and spinal cord making the decisions after receiving the data and your motor output which basically sends the messages out from your brain allowing either your glands organs or muscle to take a specific action now central nervous system we talked about it this is basically your brain and a spinal cord and identified as your integration center well what about your Prefrontal nervous system. What is prefrontal nervous system? Again, I want to always allow you guys to go back to look at this picture. So if we're identifying this as your central nervous system, basically anything coming in or getting out is peripheral to the central nervous system or are the, the sides of the nervous system. So the sensory and the motor will be identified as our peripheral nervous system because again, they are in 
degree free. So take a look at this. Again, sensory input and motor output will be identified as your peripheral branches of the nervous system. The branches of the nerves that allow the peripheral nervous system to function originates from the central nervous system. And if they're coming from the brain, we refer to those nerves as cranial. And if they're originating from the spinal cord, they're referred to as the spinal nerves, which is easy one to remember. Now, what is the branching or organization of your central and peripheral nervous system? Again, easy to remember for CNS, because there's only two main organs, brain and spinal cord. For peripheral nervous system, you have the two main branches. Again, collecting data, which is your sensory, and sending messages out, which is your motor. Now, sensory has a secondary name. It's referred to as the afferent, and motor has a secondary name known as efferent. Now, another aspect of the motor I mentioned earlier was the fact that it could be associated with the skeletal muscle and voluntary movement versus involuntary movement associated with a skeletal, sorry, a smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, as well as your glands. Now, if it's voluntary, we refer to this as somatic, and if it's involuntary, we refer to this as autonomic. Now, think about your cardiac and a smooth muscle. They can act differently, your glands also, they can act differently depending on the environment you're placed in. So if you're placed in an environment that is either stress-inducing or causes anxiety, what we activate is a specific branch of the autonomic nervous system, which we refer to it as sympathetic division. This is better known as fight or flight response. Again, anytime you kind of get that a scary feeling, the cold sweat, increase in heart rate, all of these are associated with sympathetic division, which again mobilizes the bodies for activities, stress, or dealing with anxiety. Opposite of sympathetic, if you want to say, is parasympathetic division, which is known as housekeeping or rest and digest. You better know it as food coma. So this is a branch that basically calms everything down in terms of your processes. So you're going to see changes in terms of your eye risk, your change of the heart rate, in terms of your air passageway. Um, but again, the goal would be shifting from basically activity to conditions which allow the body to rest and just maintain its day-to-day -day activity. We'll go into more details about them later on. So here is basically in this picture is depicting what we just talked about. So CNS right here, PNS would be right here. PNS will have the branch sensory and motor. Motor is voluntary and involuntary. And involuntary actions are associated or branched into sympathetic and parasympathetic. Now, what we're gonna focus on here is the structure of the neurons, which is basically the main type of cells that we have inside our nervous system in terms of creating electrical impulses. Now, there are three main structures within your neuron. The main structure, which is what a neuron always starts with, is this kind of a larger structure, central body, called cell body or soma. This is where you start a neuron in the embryonic uh, stage. And then on the other side, you have these many extensions that are coming right here called dendrites. And one single long extension called axon, which ends in what we identified as axon terminal. Now, both the dendrites, which are these extensions you see right here, and these one single long extensions are better known as processes that originate from your cell body. Now, let's take a look at some of these, uh, a little bit more detail about each of these uh, structures. 
soma or cell body is containing your does contain your nucleus and all of the organelles of cytoplasm it is identified as the a structure that's basically going to create all of your proteins and everything that keeps your cell alive. The two processes we have are your dendrites and axons that I mentioned earlier. And dendrites would be many branches typically, and they are identified as the receptive site, moving the electrical impulses toward the cell body. And then axons, which is always a single structure, it starts from a region called axon hylac and transmits electrical impulses away from the cell body. So let's go back to the picture I was showing you earlier. So if I'm looking at this picture and I'm trying to look at the electrical impulses direction, which is again, basically what your neuron makes, electrical impulse starts with the dendrites, passes through my cell body, and then goes to the axon and the axon terminal. So this is the direction for what? Electrical impulses. Literally the job of your neuron is to create that electricity or electrical impulses. And it's always one direction, starting with the dendrite, toward the cell body, reaching the axon hylac and eventually through the axon and then axon terminal. Now, a very important characteristic of the axon is the fact that it lacks any organelles. Um, so he does not have the capacity to make proteins, uh, which are most of our neurotransmitters are identified at. However, they do have an extensive structures of cytoskeleton, which gives it the capacity to move things either toward the cell body or away from the cell body. Now, because axon is a single long extension, this is referred to as the uh, nerve fiber, if you're referring to a single neuron. Again, that purpose is because you have one long axon in all neurons. Now, here in this depiction, what you have is you have an axon from one neuron coming and communicating with the dendrites, in some cases, the cell body of another neuron. Now, the area where this communication takes place is referred to as the synapse. So it's, synapse is referred to as, again, the point of communication between two neurons. Here is a zoom-in version of the same thing. So if you're depicting here, this is your axon coming down, which reaches your axon terminal. And then axon terminal communicates with either the dendrite or cell body of the next neuron. So a couple of pointers here. The way these two neurons are going to communicate are via neurotransmitter, which I mentioned earlier, should sound really familiar to you guys. We already talked about ACH previously as a neurotransmitter for uh, neuromuscular junction. Uh, now, the spaces that are present between these two neurons uh, is referred to as the synaptic cleft. Again, something that should sound really familiar to you guys since we already talked about this. The naming of these neurons have to do with basically their relation to the synapse. So if the synapse is happening in this picture right here, the neuron that is sitting upstream from the synapse is referred to as what? Presynaptic neuron, because it sits above it. And the neuron that sits downstream, which is this neuron right here, the neuron that sits downstream from the synapse is called what? Postsynaptic neuron. Again, pre as in before, post as in after, synaptic as in synapse. Now, if you look at the neurons, uh, the neuron can communicate, as I mentioned earlier, from axon of one neuron to the dendrite of another neuron, which is what I just showed you in the previous picture. Or you can have axon of the first neuron communicating with the cell body of a secondary neuron. So if it's axon to the dendrite, we call it axo dendritic. If it's axon and the cell body communicating with each other, it's called axosomatic. 
Remember the word soma implies cell body. So basically axon to cell body. Synaptic vesicles is what we saw in terms of the space or the structure that holds your neurotransmitter. So if you go back to the previous picture, these little circles you see right here are your vesicles of the neurotransmitters. And then synaptic cleft, it says a space that separates the two plasma membrane of the neuron. But more specifically, it's also, if you want to make a notation for yourself for the synaptic cleft, is basically where you release your neurotransmitters. So same picture, same depiction, the little triangular in these pictures would be identified as your neurotransmitters that are being released by first neuron. Um, I don't need you guys to know this one. This is basically showing you a drug cocaine and how they are very similar in terms of uh, the neurons. Um, and it's, in this case, is preventing the neurotransmitter. It's, cocaine is very similar to the neurotransmitters. And in this case, it's preventing the uptake of the uh, neurotransmitter back into your system. I don't discuss this with you guys in anatomy, so hopefully you'll get a uh, more detailed you know, version of this in physiology later on. Some of the characteristics or properties of the neuron. Excitability. So again, excitability simply means it's response to stimuli, as and the neuron can get excited uh, and it can create a new electrical impulses. As when the electrical impulse is created, it can travel throughout the length of your neuron. So that is basically means that conductivity, like basically like electricity being conducted. Secretion and, and a slash release of chemical. Uh, oh, sorry, secretion, which basically means release of chemical. And uh, that's uh, implied the chemical right here, if you want to make a notation for yourself. Oh, sorry. Um, that chemical implies neurotransmitters. Electrochemical response. So what does that exactly mean? So if you think about your neuron, here is the direction of your electrical impulse, right? So that's the electro part of it. Chemical part of it, again, the electricity causes the release of the neurotransmitter from your axon terminal. So electrical impulse leads to release of neurotransmitter. High metabolic rate, uh, that basically means that they're going to contain a significant number of mitochondria, which are basically the power plants of your cells. And the nerve impulse or the electrical impulse they create is referred to as action potential. We will not discuss how your cell creates and conducts this action potential inside the neuron. We'll get to more detail about this in physiology next semester. Now, when we look at a neuron, you can classify a neuron in three ways, either a structural or functional. So I'm gonna simplify these pictures um, to the best of my abilities. So look at the word first, unipolar versus bipolar versus multipolar. Unipolar means, oh, sorry, let me backtrack. Um, when we're talking about a structural classification, you're looking at the shape and more specifically, how many processes like dendrites and uh, axon are coming off of your cell body how many extensions or processes are coming off of your cell body. So look, here is my cell body, one single extension, oops, sorry, one single extension, okay? And then going on either side, here's my dendrite, here is my axon terminal. So single extension, that's called unipolar, again, single process. Bipolar, you will have your cell body. One side is going to come out and become your axon and axon terminal. 
and the other side is going to branch to form your dendrite. So again, would be one process on this side, one process on this side, making it bipolar as in two process. The typical neuron that we draw is called multipolar because here's your cell body, here's one axon, oops, sorry, here's one axon, and then you have, oops, sorry guys, many extensions coming off of this, right? So these extensions basically imply what? That this is multipolar, as in many processes coming off of your cell body. Now, if I ask you guys, what is the most common structural classification? The answer would be your multipolar neurons, because 99% of our neurons will be classified as multipolar. Hence, anytime we depict a neuron, we always depict it as a multipolar neuron, not a bipolar or a unipolar neuron, because these are relatively rare. As then again, 90% are multipolar. Now, the second concept we have is a structural classification of the neuron. That's what we talked about here is basically the same depiction, unipolar, single extension, coming off, bipolar, one extension, two extension, multipolar, many, many extensions. You don't need to know this, so I'm gonna skip that slide. Functional classification, you're going to look at it based on what? Direction of the nerve impulses in terms of your central nervous system. So, this is easy. We already talked about it significantly. If data is coming into your central nervous system, we call that sensory or afferent. If data is getting out of the central nervous system, it's called motor or efferent. Now, neurons that are located between your sensory and motor, which are basically neurons that are built into your central nervous system, are sitting between your two other neurons, as I'm sitting between. What's the word for between? It's inter. So interneuron is literally a neuron that sits between what? Sensory and motor. Let me show you on a picture, guys. Here is the picture with the same coloring we talked about earlier. Motor, sorry, sensory coming in interneuron sitting in between and motor getting out, right? Sensory coming in, motor getting out, and if it sits between those two, that's known as the interneuron, which is basically your central nervous system. And as you can see, this is a cross section of your spinal cord, which is one of the two structures of the CNS. Now, among these three, if I ask you what is the most common functional classification of the neuron, um, that would be interneurons, which kind of makes sense again. If you think about your nervous system, what's the first organ that pops into your head? Brain and a spinal cord, which basically makes these two being the essential components in terms of making decision, in terms of receiving data, and sending a motor output out throughout the body. So pay attention to this question, guys. If I ask you what's the most common structural classification, then your answer would be um, the multipolar. If I ask you what's the most common functional classification, then your answer would be interneurons. Now, the, what we are identifying here in this picture are your uh, supporting cells. So supporting cells are cells that are basically called either neuroglia um, or um, uh, supporting cells, I guess I should say. Uh, these are the ones that help either central nervous system or prefrontal nervous system to function properly. Uh, so even though neurons are the essential cells in terms of creating electrical impulses, they still rely heavily on supporting cells for their functionality. So one thing that we have is we have cells that are called astrocytes. 
um, astrocytes are going to be identified as the most abundant cell that we have. Um, their job is going to be making sure that the environment in terms of chemical environment for your neuron is most appropriate. Uh, they ensure that the ions that are being uptaken by your neuron is regulated. Uh, understand this, that when we're talking about neuron and creating electrical impulses, what is electrical impulses is movement of positive ions like sodium and uh, potassium either in or out of your cell. So if these ions are out of balance, basically your neuron will not function properly. So astrocytes, which you can see as this really large cell right here, have some of those little extensions connected to your neuron, which is depicted in yellow. And their other extensions are connected to the blood brain, sorry, the blood vessels or capillaries. And basically says, if capillary wants to send something to the neuron, they need to do what? They need to go through me. So let's say something is inside your capillaries. It gets picked up by your astrocyte, goes through your astrocytes, and then gets connected to your neuron. But there is no direct communication between capillaries and your neuron. So astrocytes, what, create, what they actually create is uh, a structure called blood-brain barrier, as a barrier between your blood, your neurons, and your capillaries, which are your blood vessels. Now, the least common type of cells we have in the central nervous systems are called microglia. This will remind me of microbes. So these are identified as the least abundant and the smallest. They do have a lot of thorny projections, and their main goal is to eat or engulf any microorganisms or dead neurons that may affect the functionality of your cell, sorry, of your um, nervous system. So they're basically your cleaners for the nervous system. That's the easiest way to think about it. So most common are your astrocytes, least common are your microglios. Another type of cells we have are called oligodendrites. Oligodendrocytes, sorry, are cells that are creating something called myelin sheath around your axons, and they are specific to the central nervous system. So oligodendrocytes create what we identified as myelin sheath around the axons of the central nervous system neurons. Now, what is myelin sheath? Make a notation for yourself. These are considered insulations that allow for a most effective conductive neuron within our central nervous system. So if this insulation is weakened, like what you see in patients that carry multiple sclerosis, um, that uh, myelin sheet is not working as well, it's been degraded. Um, but in this case, all you need to know basically is, is that myelin sheet is acting as an insulation, ensuring a fast and fast electrical impulses to your uh, axon. Now, these cells, oligodendrocytes, are only found within your central nervous system, but myelin sheath is also found in your uh, peripheral nervous system. So what those the cells that create that process? And I'm going to shift forward and then come back to this. So Schwann cells are the cells that are surrounding the axons in where? In your peripheral nervous system with the goal of again creating myelin sheath. Another type of cells we have in central nervous system are called ependymal cells. Ependymal cells are extremely important for creation of what we call cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. Um, so cerebrospinal fluid are, um, sorry, is a fluid that flows around the brain, providing buoyancy and nutrients for your brain. 
it also provides protection for your brain. It is further found inside a structure called ventricles uh, within the brain and within the spinal cord uh, through a structure called central canal. Now, cerebrospinal fluid is discussed later on when we talk about the central nervous system particularly. But for now, all I want you guys to know is if I say what type of cells are responsible for creating cerebrospinal fluid or what better known as CSF, um, that would be your uh, ependymal cell. Here is just a depiction of the complexity of the nervous system. Again, you can see your ependymal cells, you can see your astrocytes, you can see the blood vessel, the larger structures are your neurons, and then what's wrapped around the axon of these neurons as these kind of grayish color cells are your oligodendrocytes, and these thorny projection coming off of these cells, depicting them as your microglial cells. For PNS, we already talked about your Schwann cells. The other type we have is another category of cells called satellite cells, which is uh, shown in purple in this picture. And they're the ones that surround the cell body and, uh, and the ganglia, cell bodies in the ganglia um, of your peripheral nervous system. Uh, there is a still debate about the function of the satellite cells, so we're not gonna get into them. Um, as far as you know, that these cells are present within your peripheral nervous system. So this is kind of going over briefly over myelin sheath function. Again, the main goal is insulation that prevents the leakage of the electrical impulse and it allows the electrical impulse to move rapidly throughout your neuron. Schwann cells in the PNS, all they're doing is they're, they're basically shown here. So if you think about the yellow structure being your axon, what you see in blue wrapping itself around the axon is your Schwann cells. And literally the way I tell my students to think about it is uh, think about you have a pencil, that's your axon, and take a piece of tape and keep wrapping it around your axon. The more wrapping you have, which is your Schwann cells, the better the insulation and the faster the electrical impulse gets conducted. If you're talking about what's non-myelinated or unmyelinated axon, it doesn't mean that they do not have myelin sheath. It's just their myelin sheath is not as um, insulative as you would see in terms of a myelinated axon. So and again, notice both of them do contain Schwann cells. It's just this one is really tightly wrapped around many, many times versus not as, um, not as insulative in terms of unmyelinated axon. Okay, so that marks the ending of our uh, introduction to the nervous system. So we'll pick up the next PowerPoint on the central nervous system uh, as our next lecture.